one and live. Matthew, I'm so happy to talk with you. Like crazy happy. And we have to celebrate. We have two celebration to do. Are you, oh, yeah. and I don't know. I, I have also a little surprise for you. But first, celebration because Austin FC won the first match. Oh my goodness. One and one. Yes. Verde. Listo. Verde. Uh, verde. Really, man. Yeah, we really did. I mean, you know, we played a decent first half against LAFC in the first game and they outclassed us a win. Um, and we come into this game and then we play a great second half. And yeah, uh, we really attacked well in, in space and that's a big deal. So now our, our legend begins. We're one and one. That's a big victory for us. It feels, feels good. I'm liking how we're looking. As a, we don't look like a uh, um, a new team that this is their first year that's only been playing together for six weeks. Right, right. He's a very fresh, fresh new team. But also in US, you have the, um, the World Cup coming 2026, something like that. Yes, big time. We are going to be hosting the World's Game on our in our backyard. That's huge for us and for MLS and for soccer because soccer still the week I call it soccer now because I'm about to talk about American football. Right. Uh, you know, There's their American football, basketball, and baseball are still one, two, three. Soccer's starting to compete in America with baseball for being in the three hole. And the youth of America are really starting to choose the game of soccer um, over other sports. It's becoming choice number one. And when that starts happening, we're going to be able to put a better product on the pitch. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and you can also be a fantastic ambassador. I mean, now that you start to be involved in soccer yeah. with the team. I mean, unfortunately, you know, 2026, Italy will win the World Cup because, you know, we, we Italians, we always believe that we are the best. Even we, we I think we, we won 15 years ago. The, I mean, we, we don't win for a long time, but we always believe that in soccer, we are the best. That's, yes, that's you, got, you, got, you got to believe that. You know, yeah, you know, I've got a line that I'm going to keep harping, uh, and, and I believe this. Soccer ball, football, is the greatest invitation in the world. And with my job, I travel all over. I work in Cape Town. I work in Rome. I work in Reykjavik. I work in New York. I work in Cleveland. What's the one game? What's the one ball that's always there? And if you see somebody kicking it around, all you got to do is walk up. You don't have to introduce your name. You don't have to shake anyone's hand. You just walk up, pass it to you, kick it around. My kids have picked it up that way, and that's how I got really into, into the game of uh, football much more because it's the greatest invitation in the world. It's a peacemaker. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Second celebration that, that we have to do, Matthew, is for your Italian book that is finally out. And it's fantastic, by the way. For me, is in my, I mean, I read millions of books and uh, it's in my top three. It's with Jordan Peterson, 12 Rules for Life, and with Arari Omodeus. Uh, I don't know if you ever read it, um, Professor Arari Omodeus. It's a, it's a fantastic book. And um, I, I was really impressed and I was really surprised. And, and I, I want to talk with you about that. But the interesting thing is this one, that yesterday I checked the, the Amazon ranking in Italy. And uh, I, I got you, I give you a screenshot because I want to give you facts. So, and that was the ranking. So you see green lights, l'arte di correre in discesa. In Italian means uh, uh, the art of running downhill. Right. downhill. Yeah. Chapter four, chapter four, the title of chapter four, yeah. And uh, so I, 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 I see this and I think, oh my goodness, wh- why Matthew's book is only number 12? And I, I got very cross, you know, I thought, why well, it has to go on the top. So I, I record the video uh, because I, I tell you, I, I was, I'm really in love with this book. And uh, by the way, I, I have it here. And uh, I, I, j- just to tell you, you know, because everyone say, yeah, I'm in love. But I mean, I wrote millions of notes here. Yes. And, uh, so, I mean, this is how, I'm, how much I love So I, I've shot a video, which is this, and the title of this video is, uh, you have to read this book. So I went straight to the point. You have to read this book, full stop. And then I've been waiting, and this morning I woke up, and here we are, are you ready? I have my chin chin ready for you, and here's the book, number one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come yes. on. Grazie, Monty. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I needed the Monty push. Thank you. <laughs> 
you know why but but you deserve it matthew because um uh, you surprised me i have to be honest because i was expecting for the classic uh, celebrity memoir blah 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 i'm really good a couple of gossip stories and that's it and and instead i found a book full of ideas lessons and uh, i love the quotes uh, and uh, it, there is a lot of wisdom is funny is honest is personal so maybe it, it's so personal that made it very universal and resonate with me that's yeah. why i'm so passionate now about it uh, but it's it's really a fantastic book and the real question is uh, when is coming out the next one because with your 36 years of diaries yeah. it has to be more there there is. I mean, this book, I would say, is probably 25% of my diaries and journals. Um, All right. I mean, I'm working on, you know, now I keep a journal here on my phone at all, any time. I write in my notes. Um, and I've got two years, about 1,800 notes that I'll find time here coming up to go, well, let's go look back at the last two years. I do believe my hunch is that I have crystallized some of the ideas and theories that I put forth in Green Lights. And hopefully I've evolved them into another chapter. What I don't want to do is recook the souffle. I don't want to do green lights too. Um, but it will definitely be uh, something that is an approach to, I think, more qualified living. Uh, it'll be aspirational in that sense, because uh, that's just how my mind works and what interests me in, in, in life. What countries are, um, what countries is, is green lights out in this moment? Is uh, any particular country that is uh, rocking particularly well? Uh, still, so we're 25, 26 weeks still in New York Times bestsellers here in America. Um, wow. Doing very well in Australia, did well in England, Germany, and now Italy. Um, and then there's some other countries coming. Um, I haven't seen the list. I haven't really followed. Uh, I get sent each week how it's doing here in America, but it was uh, Australia took to it well. Um, England took to it well. And uh, now because of your help. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, but Italians love you. So it's, it's kind of, of easy. It's an easy country. But I mean, not, not so many Italian uh, read books. I mean, the percentage is not so high in Italy. So anyway, you know, it's a niche of, of the population. But uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's the kind of book that for my community, I would say is, uh, is perfect. And by the way, there is the beginning, page nine, that for me, uh, you know, I love those movies where there are, uh, they start with the images and just the voice uh, out. I don't know how you say in English, the voice Voiceover. out. Voiceover. The voiceover, you just hear the voice narrating. And I imagine a movie, you know, with this page nine, with your story. And uh, for two years, I laid the under 12 soccer league in red cards as a goalie. This I didn't understand. How was that possible? But because you were always like punchy or. No. So, you know, I, you're, I'm young. I'm 10, 11, 12. The, you know, what, when you're, when you're young, the kids usually don't like to play goalie because it's a lot of contact. You're catching balls to the face. Well, I love the contact. And what I would do, you know, strikers coming down, you're young, you're backing up. Well, what I loved is to go time my sprint to just meet them right when they got one inch into the box and then just dive at their feet and just take the ball and take them out. Well, I got away with it for a while because I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he's doing that. You know, the goalie always got, you know, a little bit of amnesty, you know, especially as a kid. You're a goalie playing rough. It's like, well, you know, don't kick the goalie, but the goalie can kick you. It's kind of you got a little <laughs> bit of amnesty. Well, I did it so often and became so good at it. The league, coaches went to the league. And were like, you, he, he, he's taking out our strikers. I mean, he's, he's, he's form tackling them at the ankles and taking the ball. And so I started re <laughs> receiving yellow cards, then red cards. For it because I was playing too rough as a goalie. Um, and so I led the league in red cards as a goalie for two years, yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But the, the other interesting thing about your book is that there are so many stories, and um, but, but there is always a, a good humor there. So I, I also love this, this fact because sometimes you, you know, you read some great stories, but then they are very arrogant. And I love your humility. And by the way, I particularly appreciate, I think in the last year, 
you started to do more probably Instagram, YouTube, yeah. you opened the, your YouTube channel, it's, it's going yep. very, very good, it's growing very fast. Uh, and I watched uh, the, a lot of interviews that you've done. And uh, I mean, I think many actors wouldn't do what you do, because maybe they want, you know, to have the good light, the good camera, or the, you know, all the setup, and they don't want to go, you know, like, like that. Uh, yeah. and, and so I, I really appreciate that. I think that uh, when you say Jordan Peterson, humility definition is really uh, what, what, what makes you different with, with all of the other actors there. And, and, the, and I feel it in the book is very, yeah. is very uh, transparent there, I think. Good. Well, I hope so. I've had a lot of people say like, you know, Oh my gosh, you were so vulnerable. You told these stories. Was it that hard? I was like, no, that was never negotiable. I was always going to tell, I mean, in my family, we look at the hard stuff where we fall on our face, where we screw up and, and, and when we're confused and stories I've gotten there when I'm losing my own mind, so to speak, in Australia, you know, these are, that's all love stories. It's all love stories, you know, um, cause it's life. What else is it? What else is it going to be? How am I going to look at it? So, it was freedom for me to write it down. It was not, right. uh, it's not like a tell all, as you said, I'm not, I'm not talking out of school on anybody else. I don't even think I'm talking out of school on myself. I'm just, you know, sharing the, 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 the fun stuff, the successful stuff, the failures, the screw ups, all of it. And that's all part of all of our lives. The rodeo, <laughs> the bull, we're all trying to get our eight seconds on the damn bull. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it ain't easy. So laying it out there, it's been nice to hear people go, oh, I see my stories in your stories, Matthew. Um, and so that sort of translation that people are seeing um, themselves in me, their stories and my stories, that, that makes me happy. I, I, I love it. And there are some stories that you, at the end, decided not to put in because maybe involved other people and maybe yeah. you, you, you spoke with Camilla and said, look, maybe it's better not to push. You say, don't put it in Matthew inside. And, and you say, okay, let's not put this one. Maybe it's too personal or something like that. No, the only thing that I edited myself back on were things, and I, this has been brought up, like in the beginning, I talk about being molested at 18 and being blackmailed into having sex for the first time at 15. People are like, you can't just give me just two lines and just say that and not explain it. I was like, oh, and yes, I can. And on purpose, I do that. Because I know, me being Matthew McConaughey, the celebrity I am, the way the media works, that's the headlines that they would have wanted to grab and put in bold print. And it would not been true to what the book is. Um, so I didn't want to put things in there that were going to allow people to be voyeurs on and, 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 and really pre predate on. Um, that really not what the book's about or what my life's about. Um, but other than that, you know, I mean, my mom read it. She was right. like, she was like, oh, all this is true. She goes, it's a little light in some places. I was like, it's a little light. <laughs> You know? <laughs> it's a little it's not a little light at all no man. it's not a little i didn't think so either you know but, but oh, um, and then you know for camilla and i there's i uh, um you know i share i share i'm not telling any bedtime tales you know what i mean think that that's why there's doors on the bed it's, i'm not i'm not talking out of school i don't talk about other celebrities i don't talk about intimacies it's just nobody's business and um that's never what the book was going to be you know about there's enough there's enough of hollywood i think in there and stories if you're interested in hollywood that that i share um that make it entertaining if that's what you're looking for but if you're looking for a tell-all as you said at the beginning this is not the book for you i loved about hollywood uh, you have one line that to me is so important when you look for a job today i mean I, i'm an entrepreneur so it's also for entrepreneurs is really good uh, Hollywood, uh, you you don't don't need it. You want right. her, but you don't need her. Right. And it's the same, uh, I would say, um, fear rouge of uh, uh, yes by saying no. I mean, it's a very connected uh, topic. I, I love that. I really loved uh, because I think it's the right approach. And uh, but it's counterintuitive today when you're looking yeah. for a job, you're sending yeah. CVs and so on. Yeah, I was just talking to my class at University of Texas about this a minute ago on my class script to screen and they were bringing up that, you know, and going into this business, there's their college students, filmmakers going into the business. And they're like, what do you mean by don't, don't need it? Just want it. And I was like, look, 
you can't throw that idea on somebody who doesn't have a great work ethic and is not obsessed with what they want to do anyway. I mean, if, if, if you're not fully committed to wanting to, I'm just what I tell the students, if you're not fully committed to wanting to be a storyteller and it's about the process and it's not about the result, then you can tell yourself, uh, if you're not fully committed, then you can't tell yourself, don't need it, just want it. Because if you tell some people that, they go, oh, well, I'll just take off work. Oh, that means I don't have to try. I can half-ass it. But if you got somebody that you don't question your commitment to something, your obsession to want to get something done, it's very smart, I think, to go, okay, I don't need this. I trust that I'm working hard enough. I trust that I'll take this seriously enough. But now I just want to want it and not need it. Because when I start needing it, we start thinking about results. Oh, I got to get the result. Yeah. I miss the magic in the process of the doing on the way. And so it also helps us let take things a hell of a lot personal, less personally. When, you, you know, I've been, I've been lied to, I've been threatened, all those things. And, you know, I learned, oh, okay. Okay. And I still run into those people, you know, that wouldn't return my phone call when my movies weren't doing well, but really want me. Now they're calling me. I don't take it personally. Like, hey, that's where you are. It's, it's the business. I get it. I want it. I didn't need it. If I needed you and needed you to be the right kind of person or give me the opportunity, I would take it personally. Um, but if now I just go, I want you. It's, it's, it's lighter feet. It's, it's, it's more of an affair, you know, then you're always, you're always on the approach, you know, you're dancing right. in the Hollywood. She is, she is a, uh, she's a tryst. <laughs> What does it mean? Tryst? Tryst. Oh, 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 you know, tryst, one night stands, you know, all right, all right, all right. affairs, uh, affairs, hookups, you know what I mean? Whether those be with people or with, uh, with things in our life uh, that we go, oh, it's a hobby. It's a try it out. So to think of, for instance, when I had children, you have children? four okay you got four children yeah. that immediately when you had your first child that immediately instinctually became top of your value system of what sure. you needed to take care of and your entrepreneur stuff as much as you're committed to it moved into at least second place yeah right so you didn't need the entrepreneur thing because you know non-negotiably your kids are what need you you know what i mean so it moved when it moved when when hollywood my career moved into the three spot behind my faith in my family, I got better in Hollywood. I, got, I became a better actor. I was more involved, less impressed. I was able to engage, take more chances, not ask permission. Oh, watch this. I'm doing it my way. Watch. Because if you don't want me, great. See you later. At that Hollywood wow. also starts going, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. Come here. Come here. Come here. You know? You said half asset, the, the line from your, your father, uh, yeah. the, the, the first time that you decide to go acting. And, and you have a lot of, uh, <laughs> it's interesting because I, I live in UK for eight years now. I'm Italian as my British accent reveal. And my wife is British. And sometimes I, uh, during the reading, I, I read it in English, but then I double checked also the Italian version, Matthew, no worry, because I wanted to see if it was properly translated great translation awesome. and, uh, they, and they kept all the font and everything is really uh, fantastic work and um sometimes i went to my wife and say look what does it mean half acid or what does it mean i'm sweating in my boots i i, I don't and she said i don't know who's who's saying that and i say matthew mcconaughey all right that is that has to be good so half acid yeah um Yeah, where does that term come from? That's what my father told me when I told him I didn't want to go to law school, I wanted to go to film school. And I thought he was going to say, hell no, you're not. That's a wild ass punk idea. You're not doing that. You can do that on Saturdays, but you're not going to do that for a living. But he didn't. Once he heard from me, that's what I really wanted to do. Once he heard from me in the tone of my voice that I really wasn't asking him permission, but I was asking him, he goes, all right don't half-ass it. And by saying don't half-ass it, all of a sudden I was like, he gave me not only approval, I felt responsibility, I felt significance, I felt freedom, I felt privilege, I felt accountability. Half-ass in something is when, you know, uh, you know, as you go through it, how, how'd you do? Did you win? Uh, nah, I kind of, you, you leave the proverbial playing field, whether it's sport or in life or relationship, and you go, I didn't really do all I could. I didn't really prepare the way I, I should have. I didn't really commit. I didn't really learn enough. 
in preparation to be free and play during the game, to call an audible, to act, react. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know, and I could have worked harder. That's half assing it, you know. And and that's a horrible feeling if we don't get what we want, and we know we could have done more to get it. It's not such a horrible feeling if we don't get what we want and we go, I did everything I could that I know I could have done. I can sleep with that. What I have trouble going to sleep with is going to bed going, you half asked it, dude. You didn't, right. didn't, didn't, you didn't give it all. You don't know. Now you don't know, and you'll never have that moment again. It's the idea of not knowing that ha- that, say, that half ass it where it'll come back and bite you in the proverbial backside. Let's go into preparation. Uh, another interesting topic. Uh, uh, is, you have a, a great story about your um, famous preparation and Spanish monologue. And uh, it is really funny. I mean, people, they, they will have to read the book to, to know the story. And, um, but my question is the following. If I watch you as an actor, um, I mean, it's like watching Federer for me. You know, like you are top, like at the top of the, of the, 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 the level, the technical level that I can imagine. So what I don't understand is, um, do you have any specific area of your acting uh, techniques that you think that you would like to improve or you think, ah, oh, th- this is a, something that I should, that I, I can still improve? Because from outside, yeah. as a fan of yours, I think oh, it's perfect. I mean, what else can you do? I mean, I don't know. But maybe from inside, you have some yeah. areas you, you say, no, this is my repertoire well, that I would like to improve. All right, let me say this. I've never done a movie or played a character that lived up to my expectations. Hmm. I've done work that I'm like, good job, McConaughey, you hit it, that you, you, you nailed it. I've done movies where I'm like, wow, wow, yes, yes. But nothing has ever lived up to my heightened expectations. So do I have more to do? Look, sure I do. It's for me, and especially with dramatic roles, it's about, it's an investigation of myself. It's going deeper into myself about how many different ways do I feel about a certain situation? What do I need to where it gets to a point where I'm, I'm not playing. Every character we play as an actor, we're playing, we're the vessel. It's coming through us. It's got to be personal. If we don't get to the personal level, we didn't even get halfway there. And so once it gets to the personal level, I've learned to try to work on don't feel complacent. Don't feel like, oh, you got this. Oh, you know this four ways. Well, if you know this four ways, know it eight ways. The more I can come in with an arsenal. Now, the more I can come in with an arsenal of being ready and knowing my truth of my man in any so said scene, the better. There's no end in sight for that. You could set me up to be prepared for, for give me preparation for a character. I usually take around three to six months. I could... I'm not going to get bored if you give me a year. I've got shit to do. I've got more to keep pounding into my subliminal to where I don't even have to think about it. It's part of my being. And that's when we see great performances. That's when you see your Roger Federer's. You don't see all the work he did because he's yeah. out there playing. So if you see me working on the screen, then that means I didn't do my work to prepare because when I'm on the screen, I should be playing. It's playtime. It's live, call an audible, one take, that's all we get, let's go. Um, don't need take two. Yeah, sometimes I do need take two and take three and take four and take five, but I'm going in with the confidence to go, take one's all we're going to need. And that comes with the preparation. So I could go, if you gave me two years to prepare for characters, I might get bored along the way in that second year, but I could fill my time preparing for it. All right. Interesting. You know what always impressed me of your um, uh, roles is that when I see you the first scene in a movie, you are already that person. There is already, if I look at you, there is a past, there is something that I don't know how you do it. And like you great actors are able to do. Uh, it's not that you are, you know, like a broker or whatever, any, any Dallas Buyer Club, but uh, the, immediately, immediately you are there. You are that person. And it's like I can understand that there is before you did, uh, you have this story, I don't know, but I, you didn't do anything. You're just there. Maybe it's just a look. Right. And I don't know how this magic is possible. Well, thank you because. 
if we're doing our job as actors, that's what better damn will happen. And especially if you're someone who's not only an actor, but a celebrity and famous where you got an idea of them and then you see them playing a new character in a movie and they don't fit your idea of them. It can take a minute to go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I, let me, let me, am I watching Matthew or am I watching Ron Woodruff? Now, if I do my job well, you're watching Ron Woodruff. If I do my job well, you're, you're watching that character and then saying, oh, and that's McConaughey who's playing him. Not, oh, it's McConaughey and he's playing that character. So that's, look, it's unsaid things. It's, you, the more I prepare for a character, the more I know what that person walk, how he walks, how much he sleeps, what he buys if he goes into the store, what he orders off a menu, what kind of woman he likes, how many friends he has, um, what his demons are, what he gets off to. Now, it's also help with your director and your cameraman. For instance, Dallas Buyers Club. People go, oh my gosh, how, how'd you, how'd you, the big, so it's amazing weight loss. How'd you do it? Why'd you do it? So, well, look, man, number one, it was my job. Number two, I'd be embarrassed if I didn't do my job. If I'm open, if you open up the first scene of, of Ron Woodruff and Dallas Fires Club, and he's in that little shadow in a stall, taking a hit with a girl, drinking some whiskey, that tells you a lot in the place, the way the lighting was, everything. So I'm being, it, it help makes, it takes a filmmaker as well in the DP. But that tells right. you so much. But if you saw me weighing 190 pounds like I weigh now in that scene, and you know that this is about a guy with stage four HIV, you're not in the movie. You're never in the movie. You're out. You're like, oh, no way. No way. I mean, come on. You didn't even do what you needed to do to physically look the part. So there's physical, but there's also how you walk. You know, a little thing will come. A whiteboard Rick. A little thing like this will say so much about a character. It can be a blanket over an entire performance. White Boy Rick, it, uh, th th this lady I was working with when I was rehearsing, and White Boy Rick, talk about Rick Worshey, the guy I was playing. She, I was sitting talking. She goes, you know what? He's a hands in his front pockets kind of guy, isn't he? And I went, he is. What does that say about a guy who's always standing around going, well, you see where my shoulders went? They're leaning forward. I'm not that confident. I'm kind of don't really trust myself. I'm not a, not real confident to talk to you and looking straight. Kind of kind of hand in pocket. Kind of I've been beaten down by the world. I'm kind of reseeding a little bit. I'm not not you know I'm I, I've lost more battles than I've won. It starts to carry that all of a sudden that tells what a walk is, what false confidence is when he has bravado. You know, how long can he hold the stage before he gets his hands back in his pocket and kind of goes back in his shell? It starts to, the story starts to write itself. Just as in, I talk about launch pad lines in, in you know, in, in, in scripts. Wolf of Wall Street. In the script of that scene, of the character I played, my guy tells Jordan Belfort's guy, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, tells him that the secret to stock brokering is cocaine and hookers. And I read that, I'm like, <laughs> who is that guy? Now, what if that guy believes that? What if that guy's not trying to be cute and funny and trying to get the laugh or trying to be outrageous? What if he's like, no, I'm, did you hear me? Cocaine and hookers. That's how this game works. If the guy believes that, now, Oh, there's a book written on that guy. That guy, the way he sees the world, what he's doing. I know what his apartment looks like. I know if, who's in his apartment. I know if he's married or not. I know what he's having for lunch, how many lunches he skipped. I know how much money he's got. I mean, I know what this guy's where he's going after work. I know where he's having lunch. I know all kinds of things. If you go, what if you take that line, if this character takes that line literally? And that starts to turn into how you walk, how you talk, how you move, where you sit back, where you come forward. Yeah, so it, it informs all those things. Wow, that, that's fantastic. Uh, and true detective. Oh, by the way, I, I got here the, the, just to, for the people that are uh, wondering, you know, that that was you. And by the way, it is interesting also 25 days. So it's been shooting 25 days with 4.9 million dollars. So, yeah. and I was thinking was like, you know, like you had, I don't know, one year shooting. And uh, <laughs> in my mind, it was a completely different movie. Five months of, of over five months of repairing, but five months, I gave myself five months to lose the weight. And then we only had, we were supposed to have seven, over seven million dollars to shoot that movie. Jean-Marc Vallée, the director, calls me eight days before shooting. He goes, Matthew, 
we do not have the seven million dollars. We only have the uh, just below five. It's a four point nine million dollars. Um, I don't know how I'm going to shoot this movie, but um, if you will show up, uh, I will be there too. And I was like, bam, showed up. In that eight days, he got rid of the grip department. There was not one light on set because that's where he made his budget cut. No lights, one camera, natural light. That's all we got. Let's go shoot. And we went and shot it in 25 days. Um, and yeah, it turned out to be a really good movie. You know, a great story, well told. Um, yeah, so yeah, we made that one happen. We didn't flinch to make that one happen. Yeah. I, I two things that I um that I missed in the book that I'm I'm waiting for the second one or for the trilogy. In my head you'll write a trilogy. So I'm I'm ready to tell so. me when you're ready with the second one. But one is true detective because to give you an idea, the other day I spoke with a friend of mine and I said, Oh, who are you, are you interviewing next? And I said, Oh, Matthew McConaughey. And he said this phrase. He said, Look, can you please tell him? that if he just do True Detective again, uh, I would be the, the happiest man in the world, but is enough if he just redo what he already did. So I, I don't need a new one, just re, redo whatever you did. <laughs> so it was, Rust is, is a fantastic character. And yeah. uh, I wonder how long did it take to do that monologue? And by the way, the way, so the way you move the hands on the, on the, on the table, yeah, I don't know, there are some little details that caught my attention and I, I found that monologue incredible to me it's one of the best ever in the history of uh, of movies and uh, yeah i uh, preparation there behind the scenes i would have really loved so, to read some so there's this monologue where russ and cole's getting interrogated and i knew when i got the scripts that I, I, I said, oh boy, that's a lot of dialogue. There's great big philosophies that Rustin goes into. And so I pulled those aside when I got all the first original script, pulled those aside and was like, so I had the script of the whole, of the, of the, 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 the episode we'd shoot um, that I would study for my month's work. Each one took about a month, it took about six months to shoot the whole thing. And I had that, but then I always had those monologues on the side. And every night I'd go look at them and I'd read them. I laminated them. I'd take them in the shower with me. I'd go for a run. I'd come back and dwarf and stream and read them. I'd pull them out at Saturday night when I was half drunk and read them. I'd read them after church when I was feeling forgiving and holy. I'd read them. I looked at them all the time, every day, carried them with me, just all because I knew they were big and I need to understand what they were. We get to that day and we have, I think, four days. I think it was 28 pages. I think we have three or four days scheduled. 28 pages of monologue. Yeah. Oh, we get to that day. First day, we shoot the interrogators, right? So I'm on this side of the camera, not on camera warming up a little bit, you know? And I've got my pages there in case I get off, I'm there. What I did though, the next day we go to shoot mine. What I had done is all of Rustin's philosophies, there, was a, there were seven pods, there were seven major philosophies that he went into. I did deconstructed them down into each philosophy would have like six words and each word would send me off on a theory. So I wrote the word down here so I could, right before we get to it, I'd look at the word and that would be five minutes to talk. Look down, check out the word, five minutes to talk. We shot for 16 hours straight. <laughs> and we had almost all of it done. We had uh, like four pages to go. And the crew was tired and everyone was like, all right, it's late. Can we? And I just said, without looking up, I stayed in Rustin Con. I said, fuck no, we ain't going nowhere. We're sitting right here till we finish this scene. Can we do that, everybody, for me? Everybody with me? Yes. And they all went, yes, sir. Rustin Con said, thank you. Let's roll. And we knocked it out. 18 hours. Incredible. Yeah. That's really incredible. But I watched your video where you talk about um, the, the, how 
uh, oh, shit, my English is so bad. I, I, after eight years, I can't speak Italian anymore and I can't speak English. No, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I've lost any language now. No, um, you know, the... Uh, Eight, I, eight, I, I, eight hours. You said it. You said you saw some coming up. I just said the the monologue, twenty eight pages. We did it in eighteen hours. You said I saw your video. Yeah, you you did a, the, this video on your YouTube um, YouTube channel last week, uh, where oh, you talk I, about memorizing and how yeah, yeah, yeah. mistake is think about how do you memorize. And you are talking about understanding. What I don't understand is. Okay, you enter in the character and you know it, you breathe, you, you have all the angles, you know his story, you are the character. But then maybe the director wants you to tell exactly those words or those lines, like, you know, I'll be back, <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you have to remember also all the, the, the phrases and the words. And I don't understand how is that possible to combine everything together or you say, no, I mean, I just go my monologue, as I feel it, and, and that's it. Well, True Detective in particular, Nick Pizzolatto wrote great dialogue. The monologues were great. I didn't change. I maybe changed okay. three lines in that whole performance. I think I'm the, I changed the line where I said, I actually, someone called me a pessimist, but I consider myself a realist. I just wrote, I added the realist part just to Trump going, no, Russell Cole doesn't even think he's a pessimist, doesn't even think he's cynical. He's actually saying, no, this is the straight dope, how life works. And and then I wrote, I added a line with me and Woody are at the evangelizing thing. And I said, look at them all racing to the red light. That's from a James McMurtry country tune. And I was like, look at all these people, Russell Cole would see believers people that are praising God to get to heaven, that he, as a non-believer, he said, look, they're all racing to the red light. They think they're going somewhere after this life. And it was a lyrical way. But I couldn't be too lyrical with Rustin Cole. And mind you, what Nick wrote, Pizzolatto wrote, was on fire. My job right. was I just kept trying to understand and would go to Nick and go, what is your, tell me the base meaning of this. He'd explain it and or he'd hand me a book of where it came from, where he was inspired from from. So it was understanding what the text that he wrote down was. I didn't improvise a lot in that, um, in those monologues. That's pretty much what was written. Got it, got it. And I, my job is to make it look like I'm improvising, make it look like sure. I'm not reading lines, you know what I mean? The, how do you handle the fact that maybe you have a performance on on a set and um and you think wow this is incredible and then maybe the director d decide not to use that performance because maybe yeah. it's not good for the movie so yeah. you you don't have the final control i i guess i mean maybe now you have because you're matthew mcconaughey no, it's, the it's the director's movie it's the, right. direct it's the director's movie uh, let me tell you a little trick I've, i i learned um about 14 years ago that i practice because it's true i can there are great performances out there that none of us have ever seen because they didn't make that movie or they were great performances in a movie that the story didn't hold up so nobody saw the movie because the movie didn't work man no. that actor or actress really did a great job but we never we're never going to see the light of day so a lot of things have to work to have a great performance seen has to be in a good movie as well so what i will do is after about a, a week a week into working and i'm getting in a relationship whatever with with my director and i'm feeling like i'm really into my man and i know what's true and what's not and i can feel it now when i when i make a performance i can like right after doing it i can look up to the director and go and like okay. meaning that was it i nailed it i can feel it um what i'll do though is say we do eight takes. Okay, we got that scene. I go to the director. I go, Monty, let's watch all eight of those takes on the monitor. I'm going to secretly write after this what I think the select takes, best takes were, and you write it. I don't want to see what you write. You don't see what I write. And after we watch our eight takes, let's swap papers and see, what, see if we're meeting the minds oh. of what we deem excellent and true. And for instance, pre State of Jones, I write first half of take four, second half of take six. Gary Ross, the director, hands me his piece of paper. 
I look at his, his says first half, take four, second half, take six. Well, now I'm like, come on, buddy, we're in. We're seeing the truth the same way. I trust you, whatever you say, you trust me. We both have the same measure of excellence and truth. Now let's fly. So I try to get on that same page where me and the director, I'm because I'm in their movie. It's their movie. I'm in charge of my man. And I don't want to, I've seen people give great performances and write themselves right out of the damn script. You better know that you're still under the, the captain of the ship. The director is the one sailing it. So you, I want to be in simpatico, even if I'm the lead carrying the ball, I want to be in simpatico with the movie they're, they're telling. And then other times, confident directors may have an idea, but then see something else happening and go, that's not how I saw it. But boy, that's alive. That's true. Hang on a minute. Keep doing what you're doing there. And they'll lean into that and follow awesome. that. You know, awesome. Matthew, when you uh, decided to quit with, with your uh, rom-com career, let's say, and you had the famous uh, 14.5 mil uh, offer and you stay 20 months uh, w- without uh, um, getting calls uh, to unbrand yourself and so on. My curiosity was, uh, did you prepare during those 20 months because tw- when you were doing the rom-com i like the rom-com i mean by the way i i like wedding planner with j-lo jennifer lopez mm-hmm. i mean i nice movies but you were a different kind of actor like different technically different and then after 20 months with all all the new uh, movies you started to to be on a different level on a different i don't know um yeah pr- i i think your acting quality started to increase or maybe you were already like that did you practice during those 20 months or or it was just you know stay on the no. couch and uh, and thinking no, I, didn't, i didn't i didn't i didn't i didn't practice i was just dealing with starvation i'm right. not getting no no work i was dealing with sense of non-significance because I didn't have work. I was dealing with possible regret because did I just write a one-way ticket out of fucking Hollywood? Am I ever going to go back? Did I just play my bluff and get called on it? I w- and then that turned into, over time, after about a year, I started to get a little honor with that. Like, oh yeah, okay. Again, I started to get into that. I don't need it. Maybe I'm going to do something else with my life. Maybe I'll be a teacher. Maybe I'll be a, a, a wilderness guide. Maybe I'll be an orchestral conductor. Yeah. And we had a family crisis come up. One of those family crises that even if I was on set doing my favorite movie of all time, it was one of those ones where you drop everything and go, I'm out of here, gang. I'll be back when it's done. I don't know when it's going to be done. I had to go handle it. Those things sober a man up. And talk about my want, my need for Hollywood. It was now like in fourth place. Not only did I have family, but I had a family crisis. Plus, I, had already con- I was already considering other occupations for my future. Right. Really didn't need it. And I had a hunch that, I, that there was something in store for me greater coming up, truer coming up. And as life does, as soon as I had forgotten about Hollywood, because I figured they'd forgotten about me and I didn't give a damn. Ring. Guess who's a new good idea? for the kind of movies I wanted to do. And I went, here we go. Everyone out of the way, fuck the bucks. I'm going for the experience, let's rock. And my wife was behind me too. She was like, I remember I tell that story. I wanted to do two in a row and I needed preparation, but I wanted to do this third movie. And I was like, I don't think I can do the third one. There's not enough time. She goes, do you want to do it? I said, yeah. She goes, well, why don't you reach down and grab your pair and let's go do it. Oh, let's go. And we hit the road, family came with, and man, we didn't look back. How do you deal, c- curiosity of your um, personal uh, work-life balance, how do you deal with um, the experiences that you want to do with Camilla and, and the kids? If you say, I want to go for a cheeseburger to the, yeah. tonight. Let's, let's go, guys. But if you go, I mean, cameras are there, paparazzi are there, and the fans are there, and every two seconds someone will ask you for a selfie. So if you pay attention to the fans, I'm you don't spend family. time with the kids. And, 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 and the other way around. What right. are your guidelines there to have your experience, your life, yeah. but uh, without being I, rude with the fans? 
we I very seldom out of pride don't go do something that me or my family want to do because it may be inconvenient because I'm a celebrity. Very seldom do I I have a little pride going like, no, who's wagging who, man? I'm a I'm a I'm 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 a mammal, I'm a citizen, I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm a husband before. I was a celebrity. I'm going to go do what I'm going to do. I'm a free man, you know, so I, I, I do have a little bit of an edge on that. I've learned over the years some tricks. One, talk about when you walk, you go and see me in the first scene of a movie. If you go, oh, I'm in, it's how you walk in. Now, hmm. if I'm walking in and I'm at the very beginning of walking in a restaurant, stopping to pause to glad hand and sign and talk, that lets the entire rest of the restaurant know that I'm available. I see. Then they all come up. But if I run up and the first thing I do from going out with my family, someone comes up, oh my gosh, can you sign this? You take a picture? I'll go, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm eating with my family right now, but I put my hand out and go, nice to meet you though. When the other people see that, oh, that person had a camera and a piece of paper wanted him to sign, but he didn't sign. He did stop though and shake their hand. Oh, okay. Or someone comes up to the table. You know what we're eating right now? Can I, can I say howdy afterwards? Sure. It, it, it remind I just try to remind people of why were you here before I got here? You were here to eat the dinner. That's what I'm here for. And then I understand after that on the way out, I'll give some time to say hi, what have you, you know, shake some, shake some hands and maybe take a picture or two, but I'm not going to go out and let that be. So I, I've learned to sort of, it's also if you catch people's eyes, you know what I mean? You, when I'm eating, you can tell I'm over there with my family eating. And if you come over, um, here's a good trick. You could, someone comes to the table while we're eating, stand up. All right. It makes, it makes the person go, oh my God. Cause everyone looks to the person who stands up in the middle of the restaurant. Right. So it makes the rest restaurant look over to the person who just stood up, which then makes the person who's coming over to interrupt a little self-conscious. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I'll use it because um, if I go to Italy, I mean, I'm like from zero to 10, Uh, I'm five, okay, so I can I live my life in Italy. But, you know, some, sometimes someone will stop me for, and, and I don't know how to deal it, you know, with my, my wife or thing. You know, sometimes I feel rude on one side or on the other. I, I will use your strategies. Matthew, I was curious about your, your opinion about Hollywood and the new uh, movie industry scenario. I watched the Oscar ceremony the other night, and I, I saw that uh, Netflix, I think, won, I don't know, six Oscars or something like that. Then I saw that Amazon invested like $10 billion in Amazon Prime Video and, and also music yeah. included. And um, I wonder if now the, these mega big tech platforms are considered and perceived at the same level of authority as Hollywood, or if you, if you shoot a movie for like a Netflix original is perceived as a lower level than, you know, if I do, right. I don't know. The Avengers. I don't know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good question. Look, that perception's rapidly changing because it was that way before. Let's go all the way back to True Detective. Woody and I, in the position we were in, coming to TV to do TV series, was still like, whoa. Yeah, wow, that, that, big that was great. Yeah, you're right. And actually, the success of that helped open the floodgates for what, is ha what has been happening since is that... Go to find your greatest dramas on these series on TV. So the taboo is gone. It was kind of gone before it was, Woody and I did True Detective, but it wasn't completely gone. Now it's like gone. Um, as far as status, uh, preciousness of a studio film versus Netflix, those lines are like, I, the, my sense is that those lines have, 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 have overlapped now. Um, My challenge with, with, with the Netflix and the, the, the series is that I've gone through before and looked through, you know, look, what are all their movies? And I see all these actors and directors. I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't even know that was out. When did that come out? I didn't even know they did that. And it doesn't necessarily feel like as much of a special event now when it's just thrown into the library in the lineup. Yeah. Like, just find it. Which one do you want to do? Um, so they're a little less precious. They feel that way. But. You know, once again, I would, my argument would be, I mean, it's going to go where the money goes, like most things. But number two, 
and this was my answer when I got asked, why would you go do HBO series, The True Detective? I said, I'm chasing character and story, and I don't give a damn what screen it's on. This character, Rustin Cole, I can't wait to turn the page to see what comes out of his mouth next. Now, should I not do that character that turns me on so much because it's on a small screen? I was like, uh-uh, forget that. I don't give a damn what screen it's I was chasing story and character. But then I understand people like Christopher Nolan who are like fighting for cinema and not gonna not gonna let their not not let the, the, their work be exported on the small screen at the same time as it comes out on the big screen. There's no exclusive. There's less exclusivity to it now, and it's going to be hard to hang on to it. I see, Matthew. We have 30 seconds left. Yeah. Uh, what what's next? I mean, I'm waiting for the second book. If if you don't write the second book, I call Camilla because oh, and I will. Camilla, she'll give me. Okay, uh, I'd love to. to write it now. Go back to the desert, and 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 <laughs> come out with the second book. But. Uh, What, what's next? Because, I mean, yeah. politics well, or movies, what, what? I don't know. I don't have any movies lined up. I'm, I'm really working on, hey, Matthew, who are you going to be in this next chapter of your life in the big show? I'm talking about the big show of life where action was called once when we were born and cut will be called once the day we die. Who, we, who am I like? What kind of father am I like? Again, those non-negotiables I talked about, my family, my, my, my kids. Who am I going to be? Is it a leadership position? Um, you know, I, I'm trying to, I'm working on what is best version of me going forward. Will that include telling stories on the screen? I hope so. Probably will. But I really want to, um, I'm enjoying this investigation I'm on now, trying to say, you know, and I loved the writing. I loved writing. The hardest part about writing was stopping and coming back and re-engaging with society. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not a reclusive guy, you know, but I really ended up enjoying it. I was writing 17 hours a day and didn't want it to be over. Um, so I, I continue to write. Um, I, I hope I have another book in me. Um, I know I do. I hope I take the time to find it, which I believe I will. Um, and then what's going to be my means of communication? You know, I've got, I've been, you know, what's a fun idea. One idea is this out whole book tour that I was doing with the Green Lights was going to be in person. I was going to travel the world and go on oh. stage right. and do a bit of stand up and storytelling and engage back and forth with stories and have a two hour sort of show to pr promote the book. That idea is still fun. You know, not that it would be for Green Lights, but could it be for something else? Ah, oh, that would be fantastic. Matthew, thank you so much. It was such a huge pleasure and a real honor to, to talk with you. And I hope to meet you soon in Brighton or in Italy. I'm waiting for you. See you, Monty. Thanks, Eric. All right. Bye. Bye.